the story continued, of course, in John's Gospel into the 19th uh, chapter. We have these words about uh, some of the things that happened next, some of the high points, if you will, or low points, however you want to see that. After going back and forth between Pontius Pilate, the governor, the prefect of Rome, and, and, and the Sanhedrin, and the religious authorities, uh, you know, again, the key thing is understand that the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus dead, but they didn't have any authority or power to do it. They needed the Romans to do it. They needed the Romans to do that, that work for him. But even the Romans, even Pontius Pilate was confused. Like, how is this? How is this? Why is this going to happen? And so they finally got to the crowd. The crowd, some of the same crowd that was there last Sunday, if you will, on, on um, the triumphal en en entry on Palm Sunday, that they had turned. They turned. It was like mob mentality. And Pilate gave the crowd a choice. Who do you want me to let go? This zealot, Barabbas, or this Jesus? And the crowd yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And so finally, verse 16, finally Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. And so the soldiers took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called, called Golgotha. And here they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. And Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this sign for, 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 this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic and Latin and Greece, Greek. Now, the, 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 the leaders, the religious leaders didn't like it. Pilate said, in effect, tough, I've written what I've written. He didn't have any time for them. And so Jesus is crucified, according to John's gospel. I've had this quote taped to my computer for many years. And so I see it all the time, and I've never had an opportunity to use it. But I wanted to, the Reverend George MacLeod from uh, Scotland, and um, he'd written this about what I just read. Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but Jesus was crucified on a cross between two thieves on the town's garbage heap at a crossroads so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. It was at a place where cynics talked smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble because that is where he died and that's what he died for. And that is what he died about. And that is what churchmen ought to be, be and about churchmen ought to be about. I keep that there remembering that. About that death, you know. And so even though you may be a veteran of many Good Friday celebrations, there's a lot of different backgrounds in here. Some grew up Methodist and then maybe United Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic or Lutheran or whatever. But we have this story in common. We've got Good Friday in common. But it's fair to ask all right, but what's the point? I mean, what was accomplished on Good Friday? That's a fair question that's been asked through the ages. If God wanted to forgive human beings, God can do whatever God wants. Agreed. Agreed. So what was accomplished here? You see, there was something bigger going on. And why in the world is the Friday before Easter called good? And again, those are fair questions. Those are fair questions. And to begin to answer these, we consider the tree. Okay, and this is important as it says in Galatians, right? Galatians, as Paul quotes uh, Deuteronomy, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, on a tree. And here's the thing. See, that's very intentional. Paul wrote this. And the first disciples, the first apostles considered that cross a tree. It was important they considered it a tree, just not because it made... Uh, Old Testament prophecy come true, but because the state of the relationship between God and all, all human beings was first impacted, and it was first determined by what? The tree. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is where this whole mess started, you see. That evil or Satan scored a victory that long, long ago with those first human beings. And that the first tree, the first tree, was because of human disobedience. That's important to hold on to. But 
It's the idea that God then scored a victory, the ultimate victory over sin and death at the last tree. What we think of as a cross, the last tree, Jesus' obedience at the cross. And so what was lost, what was lost, folks, at the first tree was regained at the tree that Jesus died upon. And so to go deeper, quickly to go deeper, what was accomplished on that tree then? Well, um, let me just give you some things to remember. Is that, Here's what was accomplished, the removal of sin. It was all placed upon Jesus. And I know that sounds so metaphysical and it sounds so supernatural, but this is God's plan and God's justice had to be met. And no human being was good enough or perfect enough to do it. And so God came in Jesus, the Son of God, holy Son of man, human the removal of our sin was accomplished on that tree, on that cross. Uh, it was all placed on Jesus, even today. Even if you did something dumb today and trespass, tonight you can confess it in the name of Jesus and it's placed upon Him, right? And it was the removal of God's wrath. Nobody wants to <clears throat> have God's wrath. I don't. God always loves us, but God is angry and hates sin when we disobe disobey and trespass. And so... Jesus took all of God's wrath. Jesus died alone. And I know that that doesn't fit some people's narrative about this wonderful, loving God and how he was right there with Jesus. So hear me, even though it's uncomfortable. No, he wasn't. No, why have you forsaken me, said Jesus? Why have you forsaken me? Well, because all of our sin was placed upon Jesus. And it removed the wrath of God. It all went on him. It all went on him, right? Even though we deserve it, we escape it because of Jesus. The third thing was reconciliation. That's what happened on the cross on Good Friday. Reconciliation. We're in right relationship with God. We're not strangers. We're not enemies. We're not aliens. When we confess our sin through Jesus, it brings us back into relationship with God. Not a strange, not far off. It also brought redemption because it's different than reconciliation. Redemption. That's that price paid, price paid to set us free, uh, to set a prisoner or a captive free, to redeem them. We mostly understand uh, redemption here in Iowa with Cannon Bottle Bill, right? Okay, uh, they capture five cents and we take it back and we, you know, redeem. We take it back, we redeem our nickel, right? But the principle, the principle sticks. Redemption. Jesus' death pays the price and frees us from being captives. Captives to what? Well, captives to legalism for the, in the first place, captives to a works righteousness that thinks we can earn God's love and make our way into heaven by our own good looks and smarts and decency. Nope, nope, nope. We're captives to that mindset and to legalism and to sin. And so this Good Friday accomplished redemption and it removed Satan's weapon. And that was last Sunday, and if you weren't here, that's okay. I won't repeat the sermon, but in general, evil's real. And uh, uh, we personify evil by calling Satan or the devil or Beelzebub. We personify it, right? A fallen angel, Lucifer. But the weapon that Satan had, if you will, against us was unforgiven sin. Unforgiven sin is like swirling in the drain of uh, moving, moving on to more sin and more evil. And it keeps us uh, at a distance from God and out of relationship. Good Friday. Good Friday. Remove that. God had the final word and scores the victory by overcoming evil and making Satan more powerless on this last tree. Right? So it's all these things, folks. They're good. <laughs> They're good. That's why we call it Good Friday. Yep, there was a death. But my goodness, this should humble every one of us. It should move us to be grateful to our God for the love that God has for us. Like we just sang in that song, oh, how he loves us, how he loves you. What God offers us through Jesus on Good Friday is, is, is something that should humble us and move us to be grateful for God's amazing love and God's amazing mercy and God's amazing grace. I think it's important to really get what Good Friday is. I think, and, and, and so, you know, we put a lot of time and, and energy into this because it makes Easter, Easter morning, I think, so much more sweeter and meaningful. Even if this is your 50th or 60th or 70th Good Friday and Easter, that's what I believe, is hearing our story again, the story of redemption and reconciliation. Hearing that story again, 
And then we show up on Sunday. We show up on Easter Sunday. We show up there and, and, and we hear the good news. And you will hear the good news. You'll hear the news about the, the presence of God and, and heaven's light shining upon us. But to get there, we've got to go through Golgotha. We've got to go we got to go to the place of the skull, you know. And so Jesus was crucified, and we know some really horrible, rotten things happened. And we know, or maybe you don't, you should, is that, man, crucifixion, crucifixion was absolutely a horrible uh, way to die. And uh, it was reserved for the, the worst of these, uh, not Roman citizens. It was uh, for others. And so it, it, was, it was pretty hideous. And so later... Knowing that all was complete, this is in John's 19th chapter. Knowing that all was now completed so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And so a jar of wine vinegar was there. There's some other versions of the Bible that talk about vinegar with some hyssop or some other things. It's like a, um, a narcotic, like a numbing agent. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He died. He died. Now, some of you were here this evening and you were down at St. Luke's uh, this afternoon. And so I had the privilege of being able to talk and share some of this down there. But it is finished. Those are such powerful words, aren't they? And it's worth meditating on those a little bit. It is finished. To be clear, did Jesus simply mean his life? Now, that's fair if you say that, because in some ways, yes. Because Jesus said, it is finished, and then he gave up his spirit. He announces it, or he breathes it out, either in relief or in sadness or in pain. Not sure which. When we have occasions, think about this, when we all have occasions to use those words, it is finished, or variations of those words, it's either or. It's either a time of happiness and satisfaction, or it's a time of sadness and grief, maybe other emotions like anger. Like when we complete a project or a task, something that we've put time and effort and energy and maybe money and thought, maybe blood, you know, sweat, tears, all these kinds of things. And when, when it's done and we say, done, right? It's finished. It's completed. And we feel a sense of satisfaction, right? It's finished. It feels good. Or sometimes we may use those words or variations of the words, it is finished. When something's broken, when something breaks, or when something's been used up or runs out, you know, or come to an end. Say, so, well, it's finished. It's done. Done, right? <clears throat> that could apply to a relationship. It can apply to a marriage. It can apply to a, a job. It's come to an end. It's done. It's no more, right? Or, or a sense of a security, what many, many, many people went through and still are going through for the last couple of years, of a sense of, of, of solid ground, the sense that there's some, some rocks in the river that we can stand on as the creek rises, right? And, and then we may say, but that's done. We're in a new place. We're off the map. It's finished. The sense of security or certainty or of trust, right? It is finished. We know about using those sometimes. And when that happens, there's grief and there's sorrow and there's sadness, maybe even anger attached to that statement, it is finished. It could be either or. Jesus' last words on the cross, they were remembered. These words, it is finished. They were remembered. Of course they were. They were even written down. They're significant. And I thought about that this week and thought, of course, we tend to remember the last words or the final words that we hear from a loved one before they die. We remember the goodbye. I remember my dad's last words to me on the telephone the day before he died. I'll never forget him. I, know, I remember what he said. I didn't want him to say it, right? It was his own way of saying, it's finished, I'm done, right? When he said, I love you, and I'm proud of you, and always have been, and thank you for everything you've done. And it's like, well, yeah, what? okay, great, Dad, I'll see you tomorrow, right? No, it was his last words to me, and he was saying, it's finished. We remember. We remember our loved ones when they say goodbye, their own version, and our memories either warm and satisfactory, and we can share it, as I just did, 
But for some people, maybe those final words, it is finished from a loved one or a parent or a grandparent are difficult. If there had been harsh words, if there had been unresolved issues or sorrow or grief, right? And not just when people die, we remember those last words when something breaks or is used up or comes to an end. So, of course, my point is, of course, Jesus' words are remembered and they're received then and even now. They are received with some sorrow and some sadness, right? That's a mark. It's part of Good Friday. It's part of the flavor, the essence. Is there some sorrow and sadness over the cruel and over the evil way that this perfectly innocent man, how his life was taken from him? And yet, And yet, don't miss the truth that all of us in this room tonight and online, all of us from Grandview and from Center Grove and from Wesley, uh, Eastern Dubuque, and those of you that have have come in here from none of those faith communities, and those of you online, we do remember that we are post-resurrection people. We do know about Easter. We know. Therefore, Therefore, it is possible to hold both those thoughts at the same time. That's a sign of genius, I believe, right? Is it, yes, there's some sorrow and sadness of it is finished, but there's also good, very good, satisfaction marking Jesus' words. It is finished. So to be more clear and more specific, what was he talking about? Well, yes, he was certainly talking about his suffering and his pain. Jesus was. It's finished, right? His life. It's, It's finished. Yeah. But he was also talking about... All the Old Testament prophecies and the words of hope and anticipation, what we think of as the Old Testament, all the telling of the coming of the Messianic age and and this new thing that God was going to do. And so it's finished. All the Old Testament prophecies and words of hope. Yeah, they've been fulfilled now on this cross. They've been fulfilled. And of course, Jesus was talking about what I mentioned earlier, the power of evil and sin were overcome. Satan's weapon of unforgiven sin, which keeps people from God. Jesus said, that's finished. That's finished, you know? And deeper still, like when Jesus prayed earlier in John, when he was praying and he prayed to God and said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus said, that work is finished. The work of dying in place of you and me. The work of dying in place of all humans with all sins placed upon him. That was complete. And again, I know that can be a a hard thing to get our minds around sometimes. Like it happened over 2,000 years ago. All of our sins are on him. Even what I did today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole new thing. You see, the Greek word word for this is tetelestai. Tetelestai. Okay? I'm not a Greek scholar, but man, I spent a lot of time trying to get this word right for you all tonight. Just saying. Okay? (laughs) <laughs> Not like, you know, like, like RJ's going to go, no, you must pronounce that, right? So, so tetelestai. But this is kind of a th- cool thing, the way God works here. You see, tetelestai is, that's one word in Greek. Jesus said, it is finished, tetelestai. But here's what it means. It means paid in full. It means the debt's paid. It means the debt is paid. Thus, Jesus at the very end was crystal clear, the debt owed to God, that work It is finished. The debt of sin was paid and cleared forever. Not Jesus' debt. He didn't have a debt. Our debt. Our debt. Jesus paid the bill, Is we need to understand, and he purchased the possibility, and he purchased the opportunity for your healing and for your restoration and for your salvation and mine too, right? That Those things come from God's forgiveness of sin and being reconciled to God and our relationship being restored. So on that tree, on that cross, this work is done. It's finished. And the last, of course, thing that Jesus finished and put an end to. And some of you, by the way, this is where you need to understand where we intersect with doing Grandview Reads and reading the book of Romans as hard as it can be. As, as, as mystifying as it can be and, and frustrating. But understand this is where we intersect with those things because when Jesus said, it is finished, he was also talking about the Old Covenant. He was talking about the Old Covenant, and that's the Old Testament, if you will, about law, about all the laws and all the rules. Jesus didn't say, uh, no, we're getting rid of those. He said, I've come to fulfill those. But Jesus said, it's finished. 
The old covenant, meaning when God's, God's people were supposed to obey God and keep the laws of God, and in return, God would bless and protect them. These external acts when, when God's people, the Jewish people, Israel, would uh, regularly sacrifice animals and wear certain clothes and do certain things and all this so they didn't break the law. They wanted to be righteous, right? They wanted to be connected to God. Jesus says, that's finished. There's a new covenant now. There's a new covenant right? It's what Jesus talked about on what we think of as Monday, Thursday. And when we come to the table at least once a month and we recite, we remember that Jesus said, this cup, this, this wine, this juice that represents my blood is poured out for you and for many. And it is the new covenant in my blood. It means our righteousness is in Christ. And the external acts that we may do are supposed to flow from a heart that's right, from a heart and an inner part of us, a head and a heart that are reconciled to God, right? And have been redeemed and out of gratitude and, and out of uh, humility and out of love. We do those external things. Jesus said, there's this new relationship between God and all who profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so that old way of doing things, it is finished, is partly what he was talking about on that tree. Is that all who profess Jesus as Lord and Savior and ask for forgiveness of sins through Jesus, through his sacrificial atoning death, right? Is that that will happen? You know, Jesus' death on the cross, I want you to have these thoughts as we wrap this up, as I do. It is a doorway. And we know that doorways are both an exit from the old and an entry to the new. And it can be as simple as now I'm inside. I go through the doorway, now I'm outside, right? Doorways, they're really important. It's a, it's a good image, and it's a good idea, a good thing to, to hold on to, to understand that Jesus' death on a cross absolutely was a doorway. It was an exit from the old, it is finished, and an entry to the new. This, by the way, uh, is why, uh, as people who follow Jesus and love Jesus and have hope, it's why when we think about death, as I talked to a gentleman before worship tonight, and, and he said, you know, I remember one of the first things that you said, first things when he started coming to Grandview. He said, we all have an expiration date, an expiration date on our forehead. I said, yeah, we do. We don't know when, but we all have one. It's true, but see, that doesn't scare us. Why? Because, because we understand as Christians that there's a point where when we uh, exhale our last breath, when we exhale, maybe remnants of that very first breath we took when we were born and as babies, we inhaled uh, that and we got our birth certificate. And we know that when we exhale and get our death certificate, our hope, you see, is that it's a doorway. And we say it is finished in this life, but we're about to go into something new. It's what many people love about that hymn um, on page 707 in the United Methodist hymnal. It's called A Hymn of Promise. Many people love that song, you know, and what's one of the lines in the hymn of promise in the end is our beginning. Yeah. In the seed, there is a flower. This is, this is foundational stuff for us folks. And so it's that idea of a doorway. It's an exit and it's an entry. It is what Seneca said. Seneca was a Roman philosopher born in 4 AD and he died in 41 uh, or he was born in 4 BC and died in 41 AD. Um, so he's about the age of Jesus, right? But he's the one that said this. Every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. And I know some of you have that uh, semi-sonic head in your, uh, song in your head right now about closing time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. But uh, <laughs> Seneca said it first. <laughs> he said it first, and it's true. And on Good Friday, I share that with you because, you see... That's the promise. When Jesus said, it is finished, that part of our relationship with God was over so we could go to the new. And so this wisdom is true. And this is where the power of Good Friday and the cross can find us, can hopefully find you and become real and become practical for us. You know, in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. It's just a variation of this. It's about a new beginning. Folks, look, we all have some things in our living 
We all have some things in our doing that maybe is keeping us from God. There isn't a single person in this room or online. None of us completely have our act together. If you agree with that, say yes. So see, the power of Good Friday and the power of the tree of the cross is there. we all have some things that keep us from being our best selves and living the best lives that God wants us to live. And I forgive me for sounding like Joel Olstein. That's not my intent, but I believe that is that God wants us to live good lives in this world. That Jesus said, I came to give you life and that abundantly. We all have some things. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a routine that's killing you. Maybe it's a habit or routine that's keeping you from God or keeping you from being your best self. Or maybe it's an attitude, an attitude that comes out. And that attitude could be anger or it could be resentment or it could be victimhood or it could be self-centeredness. You know, that kind of short fuse that just makes you want to burn somebody's house down when they cross you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. That's not the way of Jesus, and we know it. All of us have some things. Maybe it's fear. Maybe that's where you're living your life right now is in the darkness and the shadows of fear and worry and dread and seeing the imaginary horribles every single night, that parade, like one parade entrant after another going through your mind and you can't sleep and that's where you're living. Whatever it is that's keeping you from God and keeping you from a deeper relationship with God or keeping you from being your best self and it's harming you and, and, and those around you, it had to start somewhere. Think about that. It had to start somewhere at some point, but every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. And so what if, and that's what I call you to here tonight, what if, what if you could nail that thing, that attitude, that habit, that routine, that fear, that worry, those imaginary horribles, what if you could nail that sin, that, that disobedience to the cross with Jesus? Would life be different? I maintain that it would be. Would life be different if you asked God to intercede and help you get to the point where you can look at that sin or you can look at that burden? You can look at that thing that's keeping uh, you held back. Would life be better if you could look at that thing that's making life hard and say, it is finished. It's done. I know that my life would be better, and I'm pretty confident that yours would be too. And then imagine what would come next. It is finished, meaning new, meaning fresh, meaning a change, meaning the beginning of something better. Right. So tonight, what we do on Good Friday, we're going to do again tonight. You're going to have the opportunity to take action with that and to write down on paper, okay, over on these little tables over here. We've got, we've got uh, paper, thick paper, cardstock. It's like got texture to it that Janelle ordered. Good work, Janelle. These are perfect. <laughs> this is what you're going to write on. You're going to write on here and, and you're going to write uh, what it is that is standing between you and God. What you know that if you could just get rid of that, it is finished, life would be different. So then you fold it over because nobody needs to see it, not even me. And I'm your pastor. But tomorrow I'm going to take them down and I'm not going to read them. I'm not going to try and decipher them. I'm not going to look at some of these things that somebody wrote that are serious, that are from the heart and the head saying, God, I need your help with this and I'm going to nail it to the cross. I'm not going to take them down and look through them and say, oh, I think that's Matt Booth's. It looks like his handwriting. I'm not going to do that, Matt. Okay, and I'm being kind of silly, but I'm being very truthful. That's what we have an opportunity to do tonight. To write down on paper what needs to be finished in your life and your living. Nail it to the cross. And then walk away with confidence. I'm going to give you another nail to hold in your hand to take with you. And that other nail is going to make your hand a little bit dirty and a little bit greasy. But that's okay. You know, you, you've been through worse than a little dirt in your hands. Okay, I'm going to give you that nail to hold on to as a way to take that home with you. And remember that you, you took something... In your life, you named it before God and you nailed it to the cross on Good Friday. You pounded nails on Good Friday. You pounded nails. God is at work here, folks. And God is at work and it's possible to be at work on you and in you 
and through you. So let's take a next step as I call out to God for that. If you'd be in that attitude of prayer with me. Father, I pray that you have been speaking to us and that you tonight have helped make our heads and our hearts receptive. Receptive, Lord, and susceptible to your Holy Spirit. For your Holy Spirit to move and breathe and act in us. I pray, Lord God, that you help us tonight be brave enough, be honest enough, be bold enough to name before you what needs to go, what needs to be finished. I pray that you help us with this, all of us. And all of us pray together in one voice the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we say out loud, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.